Thank you. I have the, the hard task of convincing you to come inside uh, with, the, with the nice warm sun outside. So I hope you will not regret coming back. I'm very pleased to start with the floppy infant. Uh, the, 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 the one of you who know me uh, probably know that I spend half of my time doing neonatal neurology and the other half doing neuromuscular. So the floppy infant is a sort of cure for my schizo schizophrenia of interest. So that where I can bring two of them together. And the, when we talk of floppy infant, uh, I, I know that it's, it's really something that interests everybody because when, when you work in a neonatal unit or you see infants, uh, hypotonia is really very, very common. Even children who will later develop a spastic quadriplegia or a, dystonic or, or a dystonia very often start with hypotonia. And it's very, very difficult when the babies are, are young, uh, they, when they are newborns or in the first months, uh, to understand uh, what is the reason why they are, are so hypotonic. Uh, now, for defining hypotonia, we should not only uh, I, I think one of the concepts is understanding what hypotonia is. Hypotonia, by definition, is reduced tone. And reduced tone, you should see the baby hypotonia, so you start looking at the posture. But you also should feel, when you examine the child, there is no tone. We have to differentiate from just a, a normal laxity. So you need to look at the baby, look at the posture, and then do an examination to assess whether there is really hypotonia. And. Uh, the problem is that hypotonia in the neonatal period can be due to different uh, lesions. And this is the, an historical slide uh, by Viktor Dubowitz, who actually in 71 first, and then there was a edi uh, second edition of the book in uh, 1980, made a sort of uh, a map of where the lesion can be. So one of the first problems we have to uh, address is uh, to decide where, where is the lesion, wh what is, wh why is the baby hypotonic, what is responsible. Very often it's peripheral involvement, w then we talk about muscle, we talk of, about nerve, or of the junction between muscle and nerve, but the lesion can be higher up, can be a, cen a central nervous system involvement uh, that can be responsible for hypotonia, or sometimes MRI or peripheral system can be completely normal, and we find hypotonia in genetic syndromes, metabolic syndromes, and many other reasons. So let's start today with uh, trying to define whether anatomical whether a clinical examination can give us indication on defining where the anatomical lesion is. So today I will, um, after all the, the beautiful talks this morning about mechanism, I, I will go back to clinics uh, and I will discuss about clinical examination rather than fancy instrumental techniques or, or so on. So the first question is where is the lesions? And the second question is uh, all the children who have hypotonia very often are also defined as weak. So we, have a, we get a lot of referrals of, or we are called to the neonatal unit, I have a hypotonic child, it's probably weak. So I will try today to address this uh, question or whether hypotonic and weak are the same thing and whether we can identify it already with a clinical examination if uh, the children who have a neuromuscular disorder and uh, the second step will be once we have defined uh, its uh, uh, muscle or nerve or its brain or it's something else, uh, can we define to a more precise diagnosis? So we will start from an anatomical diagnosis and we will try to go to a syndromic diagnosis. Uh, again, trying to understand whether we can get this information from the clinical examination. Very often we are called to the unit and before we are able to make an examination, these children already had a biopsy and an MRI and all these sort of things. So let's start uh, to do reverse medicine. Let's start from the child uh, and then we will decide which test we want to do. So the first step, as I said, is uh, trying to identify infants with neuromuscular disorder. And uh, this, in, in, re in real practice, seems a hard task, but it's a very simple task. You, you have to ask yourself one simple question. Is the child weak or not? In 71, uh, again, I have to quote Professor Dubovitz because we, o we all learned from this book about the floppy infant. Uh, made a sim very simple statement. You can identify a child with neuromuscular disorders if the child is weak and uh, especially if the weakness is associated with contractures. Uh, and uh, uh, this seems a simple statement, but uh, the, 
next thing is how do you define weakness in a, in a baby? In, in older children, we can use myometers, we can use uh, the MRC measurements on strength. You can ask children to do, you know, you, you can measure strength against resistance. You can use uh, all the sort of uh, sophisticated tools to measure strength. But how do you do it in, in, in a newborn? And this, th this is again very simple. You look for anti-gravity movements. If a child is strong, will be able to lift the, the arms or the legs and to perform full anti-gravity movements. Uh, so what is the problem with anti-gravity movements in a baby? That a baby can be still not perform any movement because there is a poor control of central poor control of movements. If the baby had a, a, an acute brain lesion, so may not move a lot. So the trick is that you try and see the baby not only at rest when you may not be able to see any movement, but also in stressful condition. When it's crying, there is always a nurse coming to put a line or to do something to the child. So if you see the child doing even one strong movement, you know, if you, only, if, if you see the lifting the legs uh, abruptly just once, uh, this means there is enough strength in the muscle to perform the movement. So the child may not move for other reasons, but if they perform movements even once, uh, it means that there is enough strength in the muscle to perform the, the movement. So they are not weak. The reason have to be found somewhere else. And uh, uh, these are two examples of, this is a slightly framed child, and uh, uh, you see that uh, he doesn't move a lot. If you look at, the, at his legs, uh, there is a long time when you only see distal movements in the, in the, in the feet, and uh, there are more movements in the arms, but uh, you know, you, you, I, I only cut the last part of the video because I didn't want this to last half an hour, but uh, you can spend a lot of time looking at his legs and nothing happens. Uh, and then suddenly, uh, should be in the next few seconds, you can see that he's disturbed by something, but you see that these are not normal movements. It doesn't mean that the baby has a normal neurological examination, but there are movements in the, in the legs. The legs go up from, from, the, uh, from the bed. So this means that uh, you have uh, anti-gravity movement, so it's unlikely that this child will have a neuromuscular problem. If you look at this child, who is a bit older, uh, you see that there is an attempt to move, uh, so definitely it's not a, a cerebropathic child. The, the, the child is very you know, aware of what's going on, no facial weakness, and you can see that try is she's trying to make movements, but the only movements she can perform with the lower limbs uh, are really on the, on the bed, so there are subgravity movements. So this is the main difference. If you see a child who cannot perform anti-gravity movements, I mean, you can see there is an effort to move, but uh, she cannot make it. So in, in this case, the possibility of a neuromuscular disorder is much higher. So this seems a, a, an, an easy task, and uh, the assumption is uh, that if you have hypotonia with weakness, uh, it's very, very likely that you are going to have a neuromuscular problem. If, but if the hypotonia is without weakness, irrespective of the quality or the quantity of the movements, if the child is able to move even once, uh, there is no weakness, and then it's more likely that you are dealing with central nervous system involvement or metabolic or genetic syndromes. Uh. Now, this is the assumption, and, uh, but this was 40 years ago, which time flies. And then the, a few years ago, we asked ourselves, is this still true now that we have more diagnosis. In 1971, we didn't have any genetic tool to define neuromuscular disorder. So in 1998, probably 1999, we, we went through a, a, a long, uh, a, a quite big number of children who were referred for neuromuscular disorder. They were all referred because they had hypotonia or weakness. Uh, and uh, we tried to establish whether clinical signs uh, could identify children with neuromuscular disorders. And uh, the response was quite astonishing because when you look at children with no movements, with no anti-gravity movements or extremely poor anti-gravity movements, uh, the sensitivity to detect the neuromuscular disorders was extremely high, 97%, nearly 98%. So even now when we have all these fancy diagnoses, we can diagnose all the uh, strange congenital myopathies or congenital muscular dystrophies or all these new syndromes, uh, the clinical examination is the first step to detect that there is a peripheral involvement and not a central involvement, uh, and the specificity is quite high. The second step is to look at contractures, uh, and uh, when we look at contractures, I have to warn you that we have to be a bit more specific. I mean, everyone can see there are contractures, 
here and here and at the hips and in the elbows and so on. But uh, in real life, uh, luckily, not contractures are like this. Uh, and very often we have to go to look for contractures. And I'm always amazed that people don't look for contractures probably. To look for contractures, you have to try to extend the joint and to see whether is there any contracture here. Very often you have a child, I mean, a full-term child is in a semi-flex posture. So you would expect some flexion and physiological flexion, but if you go and try to extend the knees or the elbows, you will find that some of them may not be able to fully extend uh, the joints at, at knee level or hip level and so on. So if you go and look uh, here, trying to extend, you will find there is 30 degrees of contractures here and there is some degree of contractures. Very often these contractures are missed and this is very bad because this is an important sign that will make you think of a neuromuscular disorders, especially if you also have weakness. The combination of contractures and weakness is nearly 100% sensitive to detect the neuromuscular disorder. So look for minor contractures because they're not always as bad as the first ones we have seen. And uh, Sensitivity of contractures is also relatively high, and the specificity also. And if you put these two together, you, you nearly go to 100%. There are other signs uh, that uh, will make you suspect of a neuromuscular disorder. If you collect a good clinical history, you will often hear that uh, mothers will complain that in the last two, three months, the fetal movements were reduced. And very often, there, there, there is polyhydramnios. Now, why, why should polyhydramnios present in a neuromuscular disorder? I, I can see a lot of people. <laughs> so, so either everyone has a cough or they, they are suggesting that if swallowing is not, uh, if there is a weakness of the swallowing muscles, so the whole cycle of the, of the um, uh, life will, will be interrupted. So reduced fetal movements, polyhydramnios. If, if a baby is not able to move in utero, then he will have contractures when he's outside. Uh, and so these are all signs that will go further with, uh, uh, to, for the diagnosis of peripheral involvement. Uh, however, these signs are very specific when we find them, but they are not always found. So you have to be careful that the absence of reduced fetal movements of the absence of polyhydramnios does not exclude the neuromuscular disorder. And the uh, other things are the small dimplings uh, at joints level. Very often you see, you know, how cute has all these small dimplings. Unfortunately, they are not cute, but they are a sign that there were few movements in utero. And this is a sign that I have been uh, um, I have learned some time ago that if the respiratory muscles are not moving well in utero, the ribs will be very thin on an X-ray in the neonatal period. So um, all these children usually have respiratory problems or others, and uh, they often perform an X-ray. So look at the ribs. If this goes together with the weakness and the contractures and the polyhydramnios is another sign that uh, you are dealing with a peripheral problem. Um, attention should be paid to the fact that uh, respiratory and feeding difficulties are frequent but are not really specific because we will see that you can also find them in basal ganglion, central nervous system involvement. Uh, so they are much less specific than, than the other signs. Now, um, if you have a, a child and you have a, a weakness, contractures, polyhydramnios, all the sort of things we have already said, uh, what is the first thing you would do as a clinician now that you have done your clinical examination? So I'm not telling you off. You have done your examination. You have found these signs. What is next step? Wait and see and be silent. No. Shake the hand of the mother. Shake the hand of the mother is a good start. And, and, and the next? Any, any, would you use any blood test, any other instrument? <coughs> CK. CK? Uh, how would you expect to find CK in a child with a congenital myopathy? Probably normal. So you have to be careful. CK can be grossly elevated in some forms of muscular dystrophies, but can be normal in motor neuron disorders and in congenital myopathy. So CK is very useful. So if we want, I don't like uh, uh, flow charts, but if, you, if we want to draw a flow chart, we say that if we start from weakness contractures and you have reduced fetal movements and polyhydramnios, uh, 
and probably some respiratory problem and feeding difficulties, you are probably dealing with neuromuscular disorder. So strictly you, you should go for CK, and in the past we used to do a lot of uh, uh, electrophysiology. These days we don't do a lot of electrophysiology. For, it's not specific for muscle disorders. We mainly do an a EMG if we suspect a motor neuron disorder like SMA, or if we suspect myotonic discharges, but very often we don't find myotonic discharges in babies anyway. So EMG is a sort of torture that we try to avoid to babies, unless we think it's a, we, we need differential diagnosis with motor neuron involvement. So if we follow this, uh, your colleague already gave me the answer on this. If you see a child who has contractures, especially contractures in the lower limbs and weakness and respiratory problems, air feeding difficulties, uh, the first step is not a biopsy, but the first step is always examining the mother because the most frequent cause of uh, muscle involvement uh, in infants, in babies, is a congenital myotonic dystrophy. And very often, <coughs> like in this case, the mother was not aware of having a problem, so they don't come saying, I have a problem, and then, of course, you would think about it. Very often, they are not aware. If you examine them, you can see there is some facial weakness, probably. And, uh, but if you ask them to either to close their eyes very, very tight and to open them or to close their fists and to open them, you will see that they will do it very slowly because there is a myotonic response. So it's very important that you start your examination from your mother, as your colleague said, uh, and then you go on. But very often you can have other signs, uh, and this is, this is one case where you don't have to perform a muscle biopsy. Very often when you have all these signs, uh, in order to arrive to a syndromic uh, diagnosis, if you want to say this is a, a congenital myopathy and this, this particular type of congenital myopathy, because we, we, all, we now know many genes involved, so for genetic counseling you have to arrive to a syndromic diagnosis, but very often biopsy is not needed. Uh, congenital myotonic dystrophy can be, can be done on a genetic test, and this is the other uh, case where we don't never perform a muscle biopsy. If you look at these two children, you will see that there is no facial weakness, but there are other signs that will help you in the diagnosis. These are the cases where the clinical examination will give you 99% uh, the opportunity to perform a diagnosis without any test. Uh, this is the child we saw earlier. There is a, a very important, very marked hypotonia. There are very little movements, especially distally and more in the lower limbs, more in the upper limbs. And when uh, spare facial muscles, uh, profound hypotonia, profound weakness, and uh, this pattern of respiratory, uh, this respiratory pattern with diaphragmatic and very little movements from the respiratory, intercostal respiratory muscles, you can be sure this is an SMA. So there are you just go straight for the genetic test, and 99% of the cases, the, the test will come back as positive. So there are cases where muscle biopsy is not important. You, so keep in mind, because the number of children who arrive uh, to our unit with a muscle biopsy performed is still very, very high. So keep in mind that clinical examination will drive you to the diagnosis without a biopsy. The other thing we have to remember that um, Unfortunately, in 2011, we are working very hard to find a cure for spinal muscular atrophy and for other disorders. We are nearly there, but not yet. But there is all still something that can be treated now, and this is myasthenia. And uh, so don't miss the treatable. Think of myasthenia if the child has uh, easy fatigability, especially if there is ptosis, but ptosis is not always there. And uh, I have, I'm seeing an increasing number of cases of babies who arrive uh, with a transient myasthenia because mother had uh, an unknown diagnosed myasthenia. So again, like for myotonic dystrophy, think of an examination to the mother when, when you see a child who may have some signs of myasthenia. Now, the problem with myasthenia is that uh, EMG is not reliable in babies. It will become reliable later in life but uh, if you perform, uh, it's difficult to perform a single fiber EMG in, uh, in an infant, and if you do repetitive nerve stimulation, it doesn't always show signs of uh, fatigability. So you have to think of uh, first of the mother to exclude the transient form or to go for the antibodies receptors, uh, um, that, that is important. Uh, now, so if we, if we go back to our flowchart, we have to remember that uh, 
when we, we want to do an atomical diagnosis, uh, in myotonic dystrophy and in SMA, biopsy is not needed, and this also applies for myasthenia. In all the other cases, uh, you have to perform a muscle biopsy, and then you will go and you will have more information on which type of congenital myopathy, which type of uh, um, <coughs> congenital muscular dystrophy or mitochondrial or glycogenosis you are dealing with. Now we move from muscle to brain, and uh, um, I don't want to do a, a, a we, we all know which are the signs uh, that are uh, typical of brain involvement. Very often the children are, have a, um, they are, they are not very awake, let's say, that there is uh, um, problems with state of consciousness. Very often there are convulsions. The quality of the movement, these children are able to perform movements, but the quality and the quantity of movements uh, is not normal. Very often there is abnormal auditory and visual orientation, sucking and swallowing difficulties. We have seen they are not specific, but they can also be found. And in these cases, once you have performed again, after you have performed your examination, you will go and perform your imaging studies. Now, today I would, I would like to concentrate on some signs, clinical neurological signs, uh, that are oft always abnormal. Now, one of the problems we have when we explain the neurological examination, or we try to push the neurological examination to, uh, into neonatal units, is that uh, we always hear, oh yes, but then you have to be careful because what is normal in a prem is not normal in a term, and what is normal soon after birth is not normal uh, 10 days later and so on. So there are all these changes. So what I will show you today are clinical signs that are always abnormal irrespective of whether it's a prem or it's a full term, whether it's on the first day or whether it's 20 days later and, and so on. And uh, this is what we see in a normal uh, full-term infant, the both upper limbs and lower limbs in semi-flexion, and you see that they are both uh, in semi-flexion, and this is the drawing we have on, on our examination. But sometimes you can have a full-term infant who doesn't have any flexor tone uh, in the lower or nor in the upper limbs, and this is what we would call a generalized hypotonia. However, sometimes we see children who have a a, a, an extensor tone in the legs and the flexor tone in the arm. So when there is this discrepancy between upper and lower limbs, you have to be careful because, uh, and when this is persistent, not only when they are crying like this child, when this is, this is persistent through examination, this is, not always, this is always not a good sign. You have to start thinking there may be a problem. And uh, especially if this is associated with other signs led, like an increased tone in the leg. Um, we always say that head control can be measured at three months, but it's not true. If you support the trunk properly, like we are doing here, you can test head control. And normally, if you put the head in extension, the child should be able to bring it forward. And if you put the, the head in flexion, they, will, they should be able to bring it backwards. Now, when you see that the child is not able to have any flexor tone because there is a predominance of extensor tone, like in this case, uh, this is, a, again, not a good sign, uh, especially if it's associated with the other sign we have seen before. And you, can, and you can test this in a different way. You can bring the child forward from the arms, uh, and normally a full-term infant should be able to do this. And, uh, and then with lateral suspension, you, you, you are able to, uh, to assess the extensor tone. Now, usually these two go together, and uh, in a hypotonic child, uh, you will have uh, no tone in extension and no tone in flexion. What is worrying, and it's always worrying, uh, that when you have uh, no flexor tone, the head remains in extension, and a very good extensor tone in lateral suspension, again, this is not a good sign. When you see this and you see the discrepancy between upper and lower limbs, uh, I'm afraid uh, that 99% of the cases we are dealing with uh, either preterm children with severe PVL or full-term infants with basal ganglia lesions, and you know that these are the lesions that are associated with the worst outcome. So it's really not a good <coughs> sign, not uh, for the neonatal period, not even for prognosis. Uh, and uh, if you use an examination, as a structure examination, as we do with the Dubovitz examination, usually when you try to assess the flexor tone and the extensor tone, irrespective of the gestational, of the gestational age at birth, uh, when you are assessing the children, these are usually on the same column. You know, they may be on column one or three or four, depending on the gestational age, but they tend to be close to each other. When the discrepancy is more than two, col two columns or more, it's always an abnormal sign. So be careful to this clinical sign. 
And other, th other signs of central nervous system involvement <coughs> is this deviant postures of finger and toes. And uh, this is something we are usually don't look very careful. We, when we look at toes, we, are, we always go to look for the big toe up, which is always a sign of pyramidal involvement. But uh, the curling of the toes uh, is a sign that we often see in children with basal ganglia lesions. Uh, so be careful to look at toes like this. Um, okay. And uh, this is an, 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 a, a severe example of, uh, of uh, a baby with, uh, with extensor tone. And uh, this is really, uh, and we will see in, um, either later or in the afternoon how this is a very bad prognostic sign. Um, so this, this is easier. Uh, if you have all these signs, of course, imaging is usually what gives you many answers. But uh, if you have normal imaging or it's, it's really important that our clinical examination doesn't stop with the neurological assessment. You look also at dysmorphic features, involvement of other organs. If you have, a, especially if you have a normal um, imaging and you have these other signs, of course, you have to think of uh, metabolic or genetic uh, syndromes. Now, uh, there, these are a few examples of how clinical examination can be important. And, uh, this is a case that I, I saw some time ago, and uh, um, our friend Linda de Vries sent me this case for, for review. And uh, I learned a lot from the case, this case, so I, 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 want, I want to show it to you. Because this was a child who, f I first saw the pictures, and I was very impressed. And looking, just looking at the pictures, I thought there was a neuromuscular problem. Uh, so there was no relevant uh, um, family history. There was uh, nothing in the pregnancy, but when question, the mother said that the fetal movements uh, were a bit less vigorous than with the previous pregnancy. So it was a bit iffy and there was polyhydramnia. So all these things made us think of a possible neuromuscular disorders. Uh, there were no signs of asphyxia, good apgars, no, no abnormal um, P, uh, pH, cord pH, uh, and there were respiratory problems uh, and uh, the child was uh, uh, intubated uh, until day seven. On examination, this child had severe hypotonia, but there were some anti-gravity <laughs> movements. Uh, and uh, uh, day after day, after a few days, uh, these anti-gravity movements were increasing. So by the end of the first week, there were quite good anti-gravity movements and there were no contractures. So we had a, a clinical history of a child uh, with polyhydramnios, reduced fetal movements, uh, and initially some uh, problems with anti-gravity movements and poor swallowing. And uh, if you look at this child, if you look at the posture, if you look at the hypotonia, and if you look at the face uh, and, uh, and the feeding problems, you, you may be justified if you think that even if the CK were normal, this child needs a, a biopsy. But uh, if you think that the anti-gravity movements were improving and there were no contractures, so waiting in this case was very good because the, the anti-gravity movements improved and improved and improved, uh, and actually this child had a uh, a, a, a quite good recovery of the movements uh, and the hypotonia also improved quite a lot, but the swallowing difficulties were still present. Now, when I was in London with Professor Dubowitz, there was a general rule. When the, the, where, when the swallowing problems are more important than the hypotonia, you have to think of a prader willy And this is what the child had. And uh, uh, this was a prader willy and when you see this child uh, at a later age, you are, you are happy that you did not perform a muscle biopsy. So think of an alternative diagnosis and when swallowing problems are really more marked than the hypotonia and uh, when hypotonia improves, the swallowing doesn't improve with the same speed, uh, prader willy is something you have to test and this can be easily tested with a, with a genetic test without biopsy. And this is another case I saw when I was in London at seven days again, there is such a hypotonia and. Uh, and, and, weak, and looks like weakness, uh, but, but then at two months there was uh, a partial recovery, but as you can see, still not a, a complete recovery of swallowing. Uh, and this is another case where the examination was even more important. We had this child with a profound hypotonia and reduced visual alertness and convulsions and poor feeding. Of course, if you, if you have all these clinical signs, you want to perform uh, imaging. And imaging gave us an answer. Uh, you don't need to be uh, Professor Ferriero to, to understand this is not a normal MRI. And uh, <laughs> there was hardly any brain. And uh, uh, so 
so far the, the, the process has completed. We have a central nervous system involvement science and central nervous system involvement on MRI. So what else do you want? Well, you want to do a proper examination because uh, if you go and look at this child, you see there are several contractures and the quality of the movement is very, very, very poor. Then what we want to do, you go and look for CK, and CK were, were grossly elevated, and the muscle biopsy show a congenital muscular dystrophy. So this is a, a field that we have learned a lot over the last five, 10 years. Uh, there, is, there are a number of cases with this, uh, dystroglycan deficiency who have concomitant involvement of muscle and brain. If we had stopped the examinations here, because we were happy with the you know, central nervous system involvement sign and an abnormal MRI, we would nev have never been able to provide a genetic diagnosis, counts genetic counseling, and uh, to tell more about the prognosis uh, to these children. So this child had a walker warburg syndrome, is a dystroglycan deficiency with brain, muscle, and eye involvement. And this is another case where the, the, the mother was referred to the Hammersmith because there was an abnormal MRI and suspicion that something was, was going on. And on the neonatal MRI, there were some signs that were possible suggestive of, uh, uh, of uh, some migration problems, which were more obvious when the myelation pro proceeded. Uh, and uh, again, the examination of this child was with a predominance of central nervous system involvement uh, signs uh, and there were eye problems, but again, because of contractures and weakness, this child was, was found to have a muscle eye brain disorder. Again, another disorder belonging to the same family, and we know the genes, we can provide genetic counseling, we can provide a lot of information. So again, if, there was no, if it was not for the, the clinical examination, we would not thought of a possible concomitant muscle involvement. So I want to finish saying that uh, um, finding a brain lesion in a child who is hypotonic does not always exclude a neuromuscular problem. So be aware there are a lot of conditions and I have nev even started with mitochondrial disorders or other disorders, uh, metabolic disorders where brain and muscle can be concomitantly involved. Uh, so it's always, always important that you start with your clinical examination. And if, you, if we really want to draw a flow chart, I think collecting a good history is extremely important and then examination, 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 and you start with examination of the infant, and then the examination of the mother, and then you can go with the other steps with, the, with, the, with your anatomical diagnosis and syndromic diagnosis, and you can do all the testing that can be done. So I think this is uh, really, really important, and uh, I am very fond of our methods of assessment. You know, I'm, uh, I, I perform a lot of general movements assessment, uh, um, the Braselton assessment, I do think they are very, very valuable if you want to, if you have specific questions. But if you want a, a diagnosis of a child with a neurological problem, you need to perform a proper structure, full examination, where you not, don't only look at the quality of movements or, or behavior, but you need to look at behavior, you, look, you, you need to look at contractures, you need to look at posture, <coughs> and you also need to do a more proper general examination to look at these more critiques and others. And this is the only way you can arrive to a diagnosis without uh, just launching a big net and trying to find a fish in this net. Thank you. <laughs> Question? Donna. So, Daniel, you didn't say, you didn't say much about um, deep tendon reflexes, stretch reflexes, and I was wondering uh, what you thought, uh, especially about a uh, baby who has absolutely no reflexes? In, in general terms, uh, in statistical terms, uh, uh, absent reflexes are more often found in motor neuron disorders. Uh, I haven't seen a single child with SMA having normal reflexes or even some reflexes. They're usually without any uh, tendon reflex. Uh, uh, in muscle disorders can be a bit more confusing because sometimes the reflex can be slightly weak or even present. So it's like with CK. If the reflex are reduced or absent, it's more likely that you will find the neuromuscular disorders. But if you find them normal, it's not enough to exclude the neuromuscular disorder, especially in the cases where there is a concomitant involvement of brain and muscle where the, uh, the reflexes are very brisk. So the, this has become... Uh, it's, it's less, let's say it's, it's less sensitive to detect the neuromuscular disorder. But of course, if you have no reflexes, you always start from nerves of motor neurons, and in babies, it's more often a motor neuron problem.
was a very good review or um, case report actually in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago, and they suggest suggested by every hypotonic baby to screen for Prada, Willi, and Engelmann because they are related disorders, and also to have an MRI of these babies because in many of these muscular disorders there is involvement of the brain. I wanted to ask you what do you think of it? We re should really screen the babies for Prada, Willi, and uh, when SMA is uh, excluded? Uh, and um, mm, mm, well, if I, I, I have to say that I have never test, I, I never needed to, to test a child with Prader Willi if I thought first of an SMA. They look so different. Then uh, I think, in general terms, uh, before you do a biopsy, you want to exclude all the things you can exclude without that biopsy. So very often we do screen for Prader Willi or for congenital myotonic dystrophy, even if the examination is not strongly suggestive. My idea is that. In 99% of the cases, you find uh, what you look for. I mean, uh, very often when we screen before doing biopsy, we don't find anything. Just for screening, we don't find anything. Th I do think that the clinical examination uh, in SMA, I don't have any false positive or false negative. I, I do remember eight months ago, we had a baby who looked like an SMA, and on the general screening of SMA, didn't have a deletion of exon 7 and 8, and the EMG was neurogenic, and there was no... Uh, concomitant involvement of brainstem to, th to think of Fazio or Londe or, or other disorders. There was no pontus cerebellar hypoplasia. There was nothing that could make you think of another motoneuron disorder associated with something else. And looking at the gene more carefully, lo looking for intronic deletion, we found an intronic deletion and a point mutation in this child. So again, I was uh, stuck with SMA in my mind that eventually had an SMA. So. I do see the point that before you perform a muscle biopsy, uh, um, you know, these tests are relatively cheap and relatively easy, rather willy and, uh, and myotonic dystrophy. But in my experience, we didn't find many who had something on this pre-screening, unless we thought from the clinical examination they could have a rather willy or myotonic dystrophy. So I wouldn't say no. With the MRI, that is different. Uh, the, um, if you have a, a muscle disorder, if, if some, some years, I, I say a few years ago, but it's probably more than 10 years ago, with Mary Rutherford, we scanned all the children, we had all the babies with, with the neuromuscular disorders, and we found 20% had uh, some minor periventricular lesions or some mild ventricular dilatation. And these children had respiratory involvement impairment, so a mild distress may cause minimal, non-specific periventricular changes or, um, uh, or mild ventricular dilatation. It's different when you have a, a form that is like a dystrophy. If you have a congenital muscular dystrophy, uh, the, if the CK are very high, you want to, uh, again, I, I haven't seen many cases with a, a very abnormal a MRI like lysencephaly or uh, uh, migration disorders without central nervous system involvement signs. But again, if you, sus if, if, but if, if you start from, I, I would say the opposite. If you start from the biopsy, you can, s on the biopsy, you can uh, detect if there is alpha dystroglycan deficiency. There is a staining for alpha dystroglycan. If the alpha dystroglycan is deficient, then the chances of finding something on MRI are very high. If the alpha dystroglycan is normal, then you may do the MRI, you may find a mild ventricular dilatation, or, or, but you can see these things on an ultrasound. You probably don't need to perform an MRI. I would play the opposite because the audience here is of neonatologists. If you have a lysencephaly, if you have a cortical dysplasia, especially if it's frontal uh, or frontoparietal, do a CK, and if the CK is high, do a biopsy. It's the other way around that we don't do because it's much easier that we have an MRI in children with an abnormal biopsy than on the other way around. I think there is still a number of, of undiagnosed cases of alpha dystroglycan where they stop to the, to the abnormal MRI especially if there is also eye involvement, because they're often muscle, eye, and brain. Sorry, it was another lecture. <laughs> um, may I um, have another remark? Is that I found on the clinical basis, temporal wasting is a very uh, typical science for children with muscle, um, and they also have a very high palate. Um, and uh, also another remark, if I can, to the, um, you say don't miss the treatable. Um, congenital um, botulism and congenital um, tetanus. We don't see it um, in so much in Europe, but I think it's an important yeah. thing. No, no, and abs also absolutely, yeah. And also maybe hypothyroidism. Yeah. There, there, there are very, there are, um, 
botulism, I'm, I was surprised, I, I, I was discussing this with some colleagues in the States, in Philadelphia, and they see many more cases that we see. I mean, I, I have to say that I have never seen a single case, and uh, we do think of it, so it's not that we don't think of it. Uh, uh, but again, this was a sort of general statement. There are many exceptions, and if you go into also if, if you go into individual congenital muscular dystrophy or into, into individual congenital myopathy, there are many more specific signs. But this would take a whole day to go through each of them. So this is a <coughs> meeting that combines the lung and the brain. So if we have a patient with uh, respiratory distress syndrome who's a term infant we presently can make a specific diagnosis about 50% of the time of an SPB deficiency, SPC deficiency, or SP, uh, uh, ABCA3 um, transporter deficiency. If you have 100 floppy kids who are term infants, how often can you make a specific diagnosis? And how many remain? Of neuromuscular disorders, uh, yeah, I Or, or okay. these syndromes. <laughs> yeah. uh, and how often do you end up with a not knowing what the child actually has? Um, the, uh, in, in the paper we published uh, a few years ago, we, we had a diagnosis in uh, uh, over 60%. Um, there were still a number of cases where we did not have a diagnosis, uh, but this was pre-array uh, CGH, I guess, beca because they had some dysmorphic features and so on. So I guess that if we were screening for uh, array CGH, uh, uh, these children, we may have more diagnosis in 2011. Uh, but if they are referred because of hypotonia and uh, weakness or contractures or because of the referring pediatrician, I would say that these days we, we are able to arrive to a diagnosis in probably 80% of the cases. But this is a selected, is, 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 you know, the, the, the referrals are very selected. It's not a general hypotonia. It's a general hypotonia with a possible neuromuscular disorder. So if they are referred to me, it's because there is a, a specific question. I, I wouldn't know in the more general hypotonia field if there is no suspicion of a neuromuscular disorder. But there are still a number of cases with uh, uh, nerve involvement. I mean, it's, it's still not. S sometimes you have to wait and see. Even if th the problem with the muscle biopsy is that some cases, uh, the muscle biopsy can be normal in the neonatal period or only show very minor changes. And if you perform the muscle biopsy at age five, you can find nemaline bodies or rods that you, you will not be able to see on even on electron microscopy on, uh, on the neonatal biopsy. opportunity to get to five and have a repeat biopsy and, and that's one of the problems that we have in our in our practice because of the the specifics of our population is that we do have a reasonable proportion of, of babies who uh, born to consanguineous families have diagnoses that uh, just seem very difficult to arrive at mm -hmm. and of course the care is almost a one-way weaning process so it's quite difficult for us I think you are right, but it's that um, wh when we have babies who are in very poor conditions or when, when we realize that the families are not very compliant, we do tend to perform a biopsy even if in normal circumstances would, would wait a bit longer. And uh, the biopsy will also help you because even if you see a single, uh, a fiber type disproportion with not uh, specific of any of the genetic condition we know, you already know where you start, where to start. And then it can be very frustrating because uh, I think that only for the nemaline, we now have nine genes, and then there are all the genes for the course and so on. So it can be frustrating because you may have to go to a, a very long tour of possible genes uh, if you don't have a specific uh, feature on the muscle biopsy that will tell you go for the rionidin rather than for acta one. But the genes are there now. They were not there f five years ago. They are there now. And in many cases where we have non-specific biopsies, we are still able to, or maybe after two years of, and after testing 15 genes, but the, the rate of uh, uh, diagnosis is increasing uh, and can be frustrating, but it's becoming possible. So we are looking for extra clinical uh, handles to, to arrive to a more precise diagnosis, but it's, it's getting closer. No more questions? You are a very quiet audience. Usually there we have many more questions. Is there? 
How many neurologists are in the audience? Other than Daniela and Roberta and Donna, so it's mainly the... You are all neonatologists? Okay, so you, you should see probably babies. Okay. 